Welcome to episode 768 of Carcon Carne. I'm James Van Osdell doing this one from the home studio, the home studio. And this episode is sponsored by SopelSolar.com, S-O-P-E-L, solar.com. Brent Sopel, he's a friend of the show. He's been on this show. Brent Sopel also used to be a Chicago Blackhawk. He is a tough as nails athlete. He helped us win the Stanley Cup, and he is going to help you achieve cost certainty. He's going to help you lock in your utility bill for years to come through solar. For no money down, nothing out of pocket, you can get solar going on your house and start saving significantly. Tax credits will get you up to 50% off. It's huge. Now, there's never been a better time to go solar. And the consultation, you can do it online. It's free. It's super easy to do. And it's kind of cool to look at and go through. Sobel Solar Dot com Again, nothing out of pocket. And the second those panels are on your house, you'll start saving money immediately. Tell Brent I said hi. I miss him. We should talk more. A uh, quick programming note. I'm recording this on the 12th, Monday, the 12th of September. This coming weekend is Riot Fest. And once again, I'll be out at Riot Fest for the entire weekend, talking to the bands, providing coverage, which you'll be able to hear and see right here on Carcone Carne. So if you could go back to any decade in history, which one would it be? Well, for my guest tonight, the nostalgia trip of the 90s is undeniable. Andy Fry is a Chicago-based writer and author of 90 Days in the 90s. 90 Days in the 90s, a rock and roll time travel story. It is his first fiction novel. To oversimplify it, think Stephen King's 112263 with the vibe of high fidelity. Or don't. He may bristle at that. But he's here. Andy Fry is here. Uh, great to have you. Nice job on the book. Thanks. I appreciate it. You know, I've been watching 11 to 63 and it's, um, I like things that are sometimes dark, but that's what I, I, I didn't even remember that it was Stephen King because I, I had to take a break in the middle of it to be like, okay, there's a lot of heavy stuff here. <laughs> um, and, you know, you know what today is like nowadays, uh, the, the 2020s, and uh, I guess all of that informs sort of a reason to go back to a simpler time where there was a lot more, you know, I think better music around and a little bit more fun in the air. Well, and I guess let's start there. The idea of a second chance, a do-over. I mean, it's it's a great theme. It's a universal theme we can all tap into. And that that's at the heart of the book, 90 Days in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, and, I, you know, I also think that there, as far as I know, there's not really a book that, um, you know, kind of talks about what a great and underrated music scene Chicago has. Like you always hear about, New York and LA, obviously, because the media is is primarily based there. And we hear about, you know, um, Austin being world class twenty four seven music city, but Chicago's got a lot going on, and we have a lot of major acts from here and a lot of uh, influence, I think. And it doesn't really get its due, so I figured uh, somebody needed to cover that. And you know, who better than someone like me who wants to hop a train for a weekend and go back and hang out for a while in the nineteen nineties? Yeah, I've had various. I'd to kind of explain what you're what you just said the book is also all about that music scene and for people who are watching and listening in chicago of which there are many uh this is a book about what you know the the environs you came up in the the bands you listen listened and listen to chicago music that that is the soul of this the, the that is the unheard soundtrack as you're reading this book is the music of chicago you know i've had andy different artists from that era whether it's urge overkill or ray gun or whomever talk about the 90s and to us i mean we, we lived through it um, yeah it, to us it was kind of like a camelot period it was it was something special it was kind of magical i don't know that the artists agree necessarily but for us it there is something truly magical about the chicago music scene of the 90s yeah it's what funny does, you what know, does I it got, mean to you i got here the fall of 94 and and it's funny because uh i remember listening to you on the radio in q and a one and, uh, you know, if there was a Camelot, then maybe you were the jester of uh, the music scene. Uh, or or, or so, I don't know what the right role is because I don't. Uh, Blacksmith. Medieval history. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I was, uh, you know, I, the thing is, so I graduated high school in 1990. And I was describing this to someone the other day who I think was younger than me. That It was kind of a flick of the switch. We went from, at least from from my vantage point, growing up in suburbia, suburbia on the East Coast, that it was. You know, radio uh, had on, you know, Amy Grant and Debbie Gibson and Bon Jovi and, you know, a, 
artists that you know maybe rock a little bit to some people but there was a certain uh change i think in the approach to music that focused much more on authenticity and songwriting and you know artists that would play their own instruments and write their own songs you know as a group and that flick of the switch probably happened around 1990-91 um i think even before you know we, we kind of bookend the decade we think of, of the 90s musically started with smells like teen spirit obviously with by uh, nirvana but before that kind of easing into it we had you know the pixies and the cure and i remember probably 1990s the the, the biggest hard rock group in the world was living color you know a, a couple of guys from uh the Bronx who played hard rock like anybody else. And I think it just, it, it you know, it was when I, I, of course I wrote this novel in part because it was what I remember. You know, I, I mean, my life is great now, but it was also a time when I remember like, like you're saying at Camelot, it was um, a coming of age at the time for me, but also I remember just artistically, musically, I don't know, everything seemed to work and there seemed to be an emphasis on the right things. And, uh, you know, I think think about like when if you time travel back to another time, just to maybe be a journal, uh, a journey person, and not to fix the world, not to prevent nine eleven from happening. You don't have the responsibility of trying to kill Hitler or something like that, but just to kind of go back and experience something. And we all probably have, no matter what age we're in, age group we're in, we're a time in our life or a decade that we'd really love to check out because we think what's going on in that decade was cool. And for me, the nineties was it because I think. Uh, I literally love music and pop culture, and I think it just had so much variety and so much openness to uh, different types of music and just different types of expression. You mentioned that authenticity, which is totally true. That, that was the wave of music that came along. But in talking about that, you also referenced Bon Jovi. Can you confirm, Andy, is Bon Jovi or is Bon Jovi not the worst rock band in the history of the of the genre? I don't know. I think there are some that are worse. I think Creed and Nickelback a little bit worse. Um, too easy. Too easy. I think Bon Jovi may be the worst band ever. Could be. I mean, they're in the ballpark. So let's let's say that uh, definitely if we were going to do a, you know, a 90s uh, top 10 list show, they would definitely be in the top three, if not the top five. But neither one of us worked for VH1. So we'll have to we'll have to wait on that program, I guess. So the 90s. Yes, it, it was this great moment for music. Chicago in particular. What hooked you into the Chicago scene in particular? Because to me, it was very different. The, the scene's always been supportive. I can point to dozens of great examples of bands performing right now, but there was something cohesive in its wild randomness back then that I, I don't necessarily see today. It was just, it was a unique period of time. Yeah, you know, the first, so, so I came here in the summer of 94, just kind of trying to find a job. And this was, on the tail end of the uh, the recession when you know, nobody get a job anywhere coming out of college. But I wanted to live in a big city. And of course, I wasn't just going to, you know, not explore. So I think the first band I saw here, I was literally living in like uh, the dorms at uh, um, Northwestern downtown before I actually had an apartment. And a friend of mine said, let's go to see this this band called the New Duncan Imperials uh, at Shuba. So I had never heard of either, but I'm a fan of Southern rock and cow punk like i love dash rip rock they're from new mm -hmm. orleans they're just very similar they're basically cut from the same cloth as the new duncan imperials i remember going to shubas that night not knowing what to expect i don't know if it was just like a crappy bar band or if it was like the next foo fighters or what and just being wow but like the fact that okay we were in the middle of the beginning of the grunge stage and alternative music was mainstream but then there was also this uh ability to there was the people who were interested in going to see you know, kind of a uh, country music influence band that were a bunch of wild yahoos on stage kind of mm -hmm. doing this jumping around fun thing. And then I think the next week I went to see Echo Valley at Double Door. It's the first time mm -hmm. I've ever heard of Double Door. Never, you know, I never heard of the Double Door because I grew up in the East Coast. And I'm seeing this British rock band that is, you know, influenced by Morrissey and Queen and all kinds of different things and just put on an amazing stage show. And I thought, wow, there's so much here. And not even that, you know, so those, uh, I guess Duncan New, New, New Imperials are from here, but like I hadn't even got to see yet. Um, you know, I hadn't heard of Local H at the time. I hadn't seen Baruch Assal, even though I heard of them. I'd seen Wesley Willis walking around town. And I was like, hey, I think that's Wesley Willis. Don't don't go talk to him because he won't leave you alone if you talk to him. But in uh, Material Issue, you know, I'd seen them I'm, I'm on MTV and knew they are from here. And there's just so much here. Like I remember walking around, uh, Bucktown when it was you know it was probably it was a little gentrified but it was kind of before it was officially gentrified to the level it is now and it just felt like 
sort of the Lower East Side in New York, walking around where CBGBs is, and it felt like Chicago had a version of that one that was its was its own, not like a made up version, just so Chicago could have that kind of cool rock and roll neighborhood. And I had a friend uh, in town a couple weeks ago from Portugal. She's uh, wrote the history of rock. It's uh, an illustrated book. It's kind of a book for kids, but it's like if you saw it, you'd want a copy of this book. So I have a copy now, and she's in uh, with her publisher. I was like, we're gonna go to. A Milwaukee and Damon, we're walking around Bucktown and Wicker, Wicker Park. We're going to take you to peace and we're going to rec Reckless Records and just kind of do these rock and roll things. As I, I figured that we, she was probably into it. Um, took her to Quimby's with her husband and we like she loved the neighborhood. It was just, you know, mm -hmm. just enough graffiti, just enough posters for bands, uh, a lot of cool stuff to see and buy. And just we just walked around for a couple of hours. And I think that part of Chicago had always been here. It, I mean, it's been here since ever since I've been here. So I don't feel like Chicago ever loses its edge with music, even if Smashing Pumpkins is playing, I guess they're playing Metro, but if even if they're playing, you know, Wembley or some major stadium uh, in front of hundreds of thousands of people that the rock and roll spirit is still here. And I'm excited to see like the next wave of bands that are going to come from here and, and make the city proud. Yeah, they're, they're playing right now. Oh, are they? Yeah. Yeah, it's happening right now. You mentioned Wesley Willis. For those who don't know, and I realize, I mean, we're, you know, all, practically a couple generations removed from that scene. Mm -hmm. uh, Wesley Willis, to me, is was emblematic of the 90s scene in Chicago. He was what, six foot five, mm -hmm. 280 pound, uh, schizophrenic person of color, saw demons in his head, talked about his demons. He was kind of, he worked on a totally different plane from the rest of us, but he was at every show. Like he was everywhere. He was a, an embedded part of this music scene. I would see him on the stairwell of Metro doing his pen and ink drawings, or I'd see him at Empty Bottle or at Lounge Axe or at Double Door. He was, he was everywhere. He was the Ronnie Woo Woo of the Chicago music scene. No matter where yeah. something was happening, he was there and he got a record deal. I mean, he had his band, the Wesley Willis Fiasco, which was a rocking fucking band. Um, yeah. And then he did all of his solo CDs, all of his DIY recordings. He was successful by being this total outsider artist. And that, to me, was was what made the Chicago scene kind of special and unique is that anything could happen. Anyone with a, their own artistic vision, following their own muse, as distorted as it may be, could find their own path to success in that period. And that was what made it so cool. Yeah, I was surprised that with um, I knew a handful of people who were extras in High Fidelity. And, you know, the book, I love Hick, Nick Hornby's work and maybe his influence from what I've written. Um, you know, that book was based in London, but then when John Cusack got his mitts all over it, it became, you know, it was a, sh a story uh, about Chicago and films here. I was surprised that Wesley Willis didn't make a uh, a cameo appearance like in the record store, because you would think that he would be there. Um, I mean, Al from U.S. Maple, I think, is in one of the is in <laughs> one of the scenes and, you know, a couple other different you know music types. But, yeah, Wesley Willis is kind of like the zeit the Chicago music zeitgeist in the mm -hmm. body in a, in a person, I guess. I Maybe Chicago as a city isn't quite as schizophrenic as uh Wesley Willis was naturally but you know he kind of he kind of represents a lot uh a lot of what was here uh you go deep with talking about different bands and, and moments in Chicago uh in my wildest dreams I don't think I ever expected to see the Jay Davis trio mentioned huh. in a book okay uh which I mean credit to you I love the JDT yeah I mean I've seen them in a long time man I mean I, I, are they still around because I don't know what they're up to I swear I saw their name pop up somewhere recently, and I thought, oh, all right, good. All's, all's right in the universe. But I, I've kind of lost track, regrettably. I, I, I was going to say, did you ever expect to see uh, Scary Lady Sarah in a book? Because I don't, I don't know her personally, but when I uh, kind of put out my feelers and let people know about the book, I was like, I think I tagged her on Twitter or Instagram or something like that, and she responded. And I was like, of course you're going to be in this book. Like, you're part of the scene in the 90s, and you're Scary Lady Sarah. So how am I not going to mention you if I'm going to mention industrial and – you know, Neo and all the cool places that we hung out for a span of time. One of my great regrets on Carcon Carney is when I had Scary Lady Sarah on and I met her. We went for vegan food um, yeah. and I, I showed up in a button down in a sweater. I was coming from work and she was Scary Lady Sarah. And I, I've never felt more disconnected apparel wise from my guest in my entire life. I was like the anti cop. I was like a narc sitting next to her. Yeah, well, I was the idiot dancing in like a black top and a pair of like white cargo shorts at Neo one night. So she looked at me the wrong way. I was like, yeah, that was that guy, just in case you, you remember, you know. But uh, we all grow out of our uh, our zits and our, you know, bad outfits and you know, maybe some of in our 50s now. Sure we do. Sure we do. Uh, but going back into the whole music thing, I mean, the chapter names, they're 
their songs, their albums. I mean, they they they're things you recognize. Uh, obviously, you're you're an Anglophile. The Great Escape or Great yeah. Escape gets referenced. Um, the Chicago stuff is there. Box full of letters. Wilco saturation, or Jover Kill, uh, Sugar file under easy listening. Yeah, which I, those two full length Sugar albums, holy shit! I I think Copper Blue for me is a top ten album from the nineties. Yeah, I'm a huge Who's Crazy fan. So I actually a little side story. I met. Bob Mould on my 30th birthday. I was working for some startup. My boss went back to New York. It was, so it was April 5th, 2002. And I'm listening to, I think, Johnny Mars or somebody on XRT, like, oh, Bob Mould's going to be at uh, Tower Records in 40 minutes. So I'm like, my mm-hmm. boss isn't here. It's Friday. I got nothing to do. Fuck it. I'm out of here. You know, I like, took took a bus to a bus to get from uh, Bucktown, where I worked in a, like a little loft, very, you know, 90s startup style. And I was one of maybe three or four people there. And uh, he was kind of in this, in his techno stage, I didn't really like mm-hmm. the music he was putting out in the early 2000s. So I bought a copy of a CD that I already had on tape. I bought a CD version of Candy Apple Gray and had him sign it and talked to him for a few minutes. And, you know, he was, uh, he looked like he just got out of the gym. I mean, he was pretty fit and buff at the time. But um, I, admire, I admire his work and Sugar is obviously um, was a great part of his work too. So, yeah, he's a, he's an underrated kind of. I don't know, cornerstone of the scene, I think, in the 80s and 90s rock. As the kids say, if you know, you know. <laughs> yeah. But he's the man. So the book, the, let's talk a little bit about the sci-fi aspect of, of the book. Yes, it, this is all about music. It is dripping with music, culture, and memories, and songs, and albums, and references. Uh, I mean, the fascinating part to me is this sci-fi thing you introduced, the gray line. Yeah. Well, so, you know, it's funny when I was, when I first was writing the book and I probably had my second or third um, draft, I was pitching to agents and I, they politely called it sci-fi light. And some said, well, I only do hardcore sci-fi. So this is, this sounds great, but I'm not into music and it's not sci-fi enough for me. So I was like, fine, I'm not going to change it. But, you know, for the nineties, what I remember, and this is the other side of it is the nineties was full of urban legends. So I remember, you know, you and I remember that this was the time where we were part of the first generation that got emails and we got computers for our home even before we got smartphones we might have had cell phones if you wanted to spend 150 dollars a month so i think t- uh kind of staple to that this is the way i see it getting email an email address means you start getting in touch with people you haven't talked to in a while and then you start getting random stuff like um even before the nigerian prince that wanted to give you 480 million dollars there one of the things that was going around was um an email about a microsoft usage test where you just forward this email to 40 people or 50 people you know and hey, you never know, like uh, my cousin got a check from Bill Gates for $13,000. Now, mind you that uh, to this day, I think Microsoft has never paid a dividend, dividend on, on its stock, but stuff like that went around. So um, that was one of the many 90s themes, I think that doesn't get talked about that I wanted to work into it. So I thought if someone's going to time travel back to the past, I mean, I could have just a, you know, kind of a, a, a stereotypical time machine and I'm not really a sci-fi expert, but I thought what better way than to use a piece of Chicago, take the gray line, you know, we would take the CTA. We have a red line that goes north and south. We have a blue line that goes to the airport, yada, yada. Um, why not invent uh, a la- line of the train that, you know, may or may not exist if you're listening to the urban legends. Um, and when Darby, you know, Darby comes back to Chicago to take over her uncle's record store. She starts getting back into her inner music lover. And, and Darby, we, we haven't introduced yeah. Darby as the main character of the book. Darby's main character, you know, she loves the music scene. She's kind of getting back into where she was and thinking, why did I leave this great city? I, I liked it here and the music scene was great. And she gets a little nostalgic as Gen Xers probably would and people who love music would. <laughs> and finds uh, finds out that the gray line isn't just an urban legend, it's real and, you know, presents herself with the option, should I go back to the 1990s? You know, the, that time that I left to see if I could re- reboot my life and do some things over and of course, you know, I guess the subplot is that she goes back to the 1990s, goes back to the day that she originally left Chicago and ends up having a little bit too much of a good time in the music scene. And maybe maybe parties her ass off a little bit too much and, uh, you know, start seeing this girl that she likes and doesn't deal with her shit, which I guess is the subplot of, you know, a lot of sort of relationship, personal type of stories. But yeah, it just seemed like a natural fit. I, I mean, I think in the beginning I was trying to I struggle with like, how do I get her back in time? And my my method wasn't really defined. And probably somewhere about a year, year and a half into writing the book, I thought, oh, this this idea would work. I got to figure out how to do it. But yeah, you know, there could be a a train that goes back to the past. Why not? And 
part of it's probably going to run through Wicker Park and Bucktown and other places, and you just got to find the stops. And you know, like you said, if you know, you know. Uh, not everybody knows about it, but but she gets uh, the word and you know, decides to hop on. I mean, I love the concept and the idea of her inheriting the record store. That to me is like a dream come true. Yeah. Is is there some wish fulfillment in writing? Like, oh man, I wish I'd gone in that direction. I wish I'd been that music nerd who opened up a record shop or pursued yeah. mu- music more in, in a certain direction. Well, so I, I, one of my, I, I hired, hired an editor in the middle of the process to kind of get me to figure out how to do this. And if she and another person says, well, why, if she has this great record store, like, why would she want to go back to the past? And I thought, well, like, I love hanging out in a record store, but I've worked retail and I've, I've done jobs where like, it's supposed to be the best thing ever. And then you realize when you get into the nuts and bolts of it, I mean, maybe I'm just a little bit too much of a spaz and I need to be moving around a lot, but you know, that works for some people and it's maybe not right for everybody. And in the beginning when she inherited, like she, uh, she loses touch with her uncle Martin, as we all do. We all lose touch with, you know, favorite uncles and aunts and grandparents and so on. And then when they pass on, we feel really bad. And that's sort of the impetus for that. Um, right about the time in her life uh, in New York and her Wall Street career is falling apart after she makes some bad crypto trades and some bad decisions and moves back to Chicago right at this time that, you know, she finds out she inherits the record store from Uncle Martin, who was like the first person who turned her on to music and really like you could knew how to communicate with her and they just had a thing so uh yeah the, the record store is great she feels like she's taken on the, uh his legacy running this successful record store but feels like it's not really hers and it's just you know it's another thing that is part of her grass is greener mentality and, and it, i think whether or not it's a good lesson when she goes back in time and kind of relives her life she realizes that the grass is greener mentality she needs to get over that and I think in just hers in Darby's situation that the record store was great. You know, it's a fun stop, but she had some other business that she had to deal with. And that's why she does move on to take the gray line to go back to the nineties and try to figure her life out and fix some things. One of the really appealing ideas of going back to the nineties, which you touch on, uh, especially in this era of being overconnected and overstimulated by cell phones and doom scrolling and the, the endless fire hose of information a world without cell phones. Yeah. There's something just so, so peaceful and blissful about that idea to me right now. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, I remember walking around, you know, I, I knew one or two people with cell phones in 1996 or seven, and they usually were for a big, you know, what big eight now, big six firm. I mean, it was big four, you know, they were the hyper successful, um, you know, straight A types who got, but they had an internship before they had a job. And probably they weren't kind of paying for, for their cell phone. The work was so it was a, a part of life that wasn't really wasn't really necessary. It wasn't seen as as necessary. So there's actually a, a scene that you you probably remember where Darby gets on the bus. Um, she's coming back from somewhere, and she sees these young like goth, you know, punk girls sort of get an argument on the bus about. Essentially, it's like this actually happened that people used to have these debates about whether it was punk or not to have a cell phone. Like now everybody has a cellular phone. You wouldn't think not to have one uh, back. But back in the 90s, you might think, well, does that fit what I'm does that fit my ethic and my rep? You know, if, if I'm <laughs> if I'm a punk and I love punk music, am I selling out by getting a cellular phone or mobile service? Um, we debated those things and we struggle with those. <laughs> back it's kind of comical to think of it that way, I think. And that's why I wanted to include a scene like that. And you know, fax machines and all that fun stuff that doesn't really exist anymore. You are prior to this book. I mean, you're, you've made your, your trade writing nonfiction. Yeah. Fiction, fiction, fiction writing is a totally different muscle to use. Yeah. Was it something that you you'd always wanted to kind of flex? Was it something that just clicked for you and, and you thought, this is it. I got to do this. I think a lot of people are writers, either we have we we have an idea for a book or we maybe take it to the next step. We we want to see if you can pull off writing a book. So I think for years I had a lot of ideas. You know, I, I write mostly about sports. So I thought about writing a book about sports writing or a sports writer. And I guess it kept knocking on the back of my brain that um, I live in Chicago and I love music and maybe, you know, maybe it's it's more of a hobby for me. I, I wrote for Rolling Stone for a while, but strangely wrote more about sports and pop culture than than straight up music. But I kind of, uh, I mean, maybe when I was 1920, sort of like the, the movie Almost Famous, like I wanted to interview and follow Led Zeppelin and all that stuff. So doing fiction, the cool part is that you can 
you can participate in a realistic scene. And this is where maybe I described 90 days of the 90s as magical realism, not science fiction, that you can be in a real place and sort of take a different turn and, and shake up some things and can kind of conveniently make, uh, not make up facts, but you can craft the scene that sort of fits your agenda and fits the, the themes of your story. So in the beginning, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I just had a, what I thought was a great idea. Like, hey, time travel back to the past. Like, okay, now how do I come up with 70 to 100,000 words to make a book? And started with just kind of the scenes. Like, where would I go? I'd probably go to Lounge X. I'd probably go you know, to Double Door. And I would go to the old sandwich shop that I love that's been shut down forever. And then what kind of people would I hang out with? And that's where you, you start to develop characters. And really what it became because was that, I developed characters in a scene that I wanted to hang out in. So people say, you know, it's got to be hard to write a book. But for me, for the better part of five years, I just had this place that I could go hang out with in the 90s with these cool 90s people, which is was a great thing. It made it easier to write the book and made me want to keep it going and finish it and refine it and edit it and do all these things that you got to do to make it readable enough so an audience will, you know, I hope, stick with it to the end. But yeah, it was really like I created my own, you know, 90, 1990s refuge with all the greatest bands I could see whenever I wanted. And that was a pretty great place to be. All right. So we've established that the 90s were awesome. Lots yeah. of great bands, lots of cool stuff to do. Are we just old men by saying, yeah, the, these decades suck. The 10s were terrible. The 20s so far, they're awful. Or the aughts were garbage. I mean, is that just old man-itis? I don't know. So I've got a 16 year old son. We're going to Riot Fest next weekend. And a year ago, we saw Guns N' Roses on a Thursday night and went to Riot Fest the next day. And I don't think he's he likes the music that he likes just because of me. I mean, he likes some of the, the English stuff that I like, like the Stone Roses and the Verve and Oasis. But he's kind of more into his, his uh, music that's influenced by garage rock is what I would call it, like Dinosaur Jr. and the Strokes and um, Interpol and you know, all kinds of modest mouse. And I, I think there's an interest in authenticity and looking up bands on Spotify or wherever you find them record store to, and not just tuning in to listen to whatever everyone else is listening to. And I, I poll his friends too. Like I pick him up from, you know, dances or from school or whatever and dr drive his friends home. And a lot of his friends are girls. And I say like, you know, Izzy, do you like, uh, do you like Cypress Hill expecting to hear, I don't know, or who are they? And instead, the answer is yes. I love Cypress Hill, and I've, or I've never seen. I want to see Cypress Hill. I could never see them. Well, like you're 15, of course you haven't seen them yet. But no, I think that there is. I can't say like what the record labels are doing, and if if there's going to be, you know, the next Nirvana or Radiohead's going to come out, and we're going to you know, change back to the sort of scene that we had in the 90s. I who knows about that? But I feel like there is, and it's not just a pendulum swing towards 90s like the 90s are, are going to be cool again it's i feel like there's an interest in music that seems like it is you know i keep using the term or authentic but it's it's not just put together by a couple of producers at a record company or you know crafted to be whatever they think that audiences want to hear that there's a genuine interest in good music and of course when there's an interest in that you're going to start with what's already out there whether it's 10 or 20 or 40 years old yeah, I think that there is a there's an impetus to go back to you know what's out there that's already good and what what can we what can we check out? And I don't know. I just I just think that there is a reemergence of interest in the good stuff, and I think that's a good thing. See, this is something I keep wondering and I keep thinking about. I'm dragging you down my rabbit hole, but I wonder with the advent of the internet, when yeah. the ability to find music became democratized and you could find anything. At, anywhere at any time curation kind of went away and i think in the 90s everyone knew the sources for music whether it was word of mouth or whether it was radio or rolling stone spin blender whatever or fanzines you know combing the shelves of quimby's you kind of knew where to find stuff everyone kind of knew and there were i think it was easier for bands to bubble up when there were curators helping it along in our algorithmic world where everything is everywhere and i think it's much harder for anything to raise its hand I don't know. You know, I think about the cool part about Spotify. I know it's not the greatest for artists, but, you know, I do pay for my my uh, membership and I do actually go buy CDs and, and everything else. Lots of merch. Like I remember loving for the brief period that I heard it, some of the shoegaze bands like Chapter House and um, 
Like I, you could readily find My Bloody Valentine and Lush, but I remember Chapter House thinking I like that band or Slow Dive. And it being like two decades that I couldn't find anything. I mean, you're definitely not going to go into Best Buy um, or Circuit City when it's back open. Or even like you go to a local record store, you got to you got to order that kind of stuff. Now, I mean, maybe it's technology makes us lazy, but if I want to go find something that is put out by Chapter House or a n- number of bands I've never heard of that sound like them, like the Drop 19s that, you know, I, we think of it, we have this golden age fallacy. We think of it like, oh, it's better. You know, we all knew the sources of music. And yes, to some degree, that was that was true. But it was, I mean, we forget about the parts that were harder, you know, that, um, it, you know, I, I think about going to bands, so going to lounge X to see bands I wanted to see that I couldn't get in to see. I think, uh, you know, for the bands that are still around or coming back, and I think of like merge records, bringing back, you know, the Spinanes and a lot of bands on labels that probably, you know, they would probably be out of print by now. I want to say that maybe technology pushes some of that and the fact that we're still alive, you know, that that creates a market and demand for the breadth and variety of music that has always been out there. But I feel like now that's easier to find. So uh, it could go both ways. I feel like, yeah, you know, it was great when I, I lived, grew up in the East Coast, I would jump in the car for an hour and a half and go to Princeton and go to Princeton Records, Record Exchange or someplace where I could find something that I couldn't find anywhere else. I definitely wouldn't find it in the mall. But now um, the road travel to get good music is a little bit easier. And I think there's something to be appreciated about that. For sure. For sure. Okay. So 90 Days in the 90s is the book. You are Andy Fry. Uh, if people want to read this and they want to get their hands on it, which, by the way, this is beautifully formatted. Yeah, I mean, they did a good job. They did a really good job. If people want to get their hands on it, what do they do? Yeah, so if you want uh, you want me to sign a copy, send you some swag, go to 90daysinthe90s.com. That's with the numbers, 90. Uh, or, uh, you know, if you're joined at the hip to Amazon like everybody else is, you can point and click and just buy it on Amazon and uh, or Barnes & Noble or any other place. But there's actually, like, I've gone around town, and there are a couple copies at Reckless Records, um, both of the ones, um, Belmont and uh wicker park and there's uh i think a couple copies of quimby's in different places you know just got to try to keep the record the, the small record in bookstores engaged there but yeah there's a number of different ways you can get it and but you can go to my website if you want to start there well, yeah who wouldn't want a personalized copy yeah and oh, that's yeah. the way well, to go put your name in it and i don't know what i wrote to you like hey james enjoy the 90s again or something like it's, that it was something like that uh i love it nice job on the book Thanks. And I, I can't wait to see if you keep going down this fiction road. Yeah, maybe I'll bump into you back at, uh, you know, like Lounge Axe in 96 at some point, you know. Or short term, why don't I just see you at Riot Fest? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're going to have better seats than I am, but yeah, I'll see you there. <laughs> seats. Seats, come on. <laughs>